morning. Muy buenos días. Welcome to the HEADS 2020 Best Practices Showcase, celebrating technology innovation for Hispanic success in higher education. On behalf of the Hispanic Educational Technology <coughs> Services Consortium, we, walk, we would like to thank you for being with us this morning. My name is Lin Collazo Carro, and I will be your host. Again, we want to thank all presenters and participants who attend this event. Although we are having an emergency happening at the south part of our island. We truly appreciate your support, especially the ones coming from the United States and Latin America. We are really pleased to have all of you here and being able to hold this event with, our value, with your valuable collaboration. We hope you have not experienced any tremors during your stay. If something happens, please remember to keep calm, get down, and cover your head. For those who were not able to join us yesterday, uh, I want to point out that there is, there is simultaneous uh, translation available. Uh, headsets are available at the registration area for your convenience. Also, all the presentations are being recorded and will be uploaded at the HEADS website during the following weeks. An email will be sent to all participants to invite you to visit heads.org to access all those videos and share them among your colleagues. To begin this event, I would like to acknowledge the presence of several people who have been fundamental in the development and continuous transformation of the HEADS Consortium. First, HEADS would like to acknowledge the presidents and board member representatives of its member institutions from Puerto Rico, the United States, and Colombia accompanying us today. Thank you for sharing this special occasion with us. Please, a round of applause. <laughs> Likewise, HEADS would like to, go to recognize again those corporations and organizations that have made this event possible. First, we would like to mention our host institution, Inter-American University, and its outstanding staff at the School of Law. And EDP University for the ground transportation of our attendees coming from outside the island and the technical support on the concurrent sessions. Also, we would like to recognize our sponsors, Blackboard, the Educational Testing Service, Incumatic, former Grupo Parada, Interstaff, Met. PR to Domain, Lighthouse Translation and Interpretation Services, Cape Air, and United Airlines. And we, de we are uh, deeply grateful for your support. Applause, please. <clears throat> Before we proceed with this morning's track winners uh, panel discussion, we would like to acknowledge the valuable collaboration of the evaluation committee appointed by the board of directors in charge of reviewing and scoring projects submitted in order to select the top best practices to be presented at this event. This group is truly exemplary, uh, is a truly exemplary group of professionals. Their dedication and passion transcended their volunteer work, assessing more than 20 proposals competing to be showcased in this event. To recognize individually, we included their names by focus areas, also known as tracks, in the conference program. Thank you again for your support on this important task. Another round of applause for them, please. <laughs> the HEADS Consortium is overly excited to have been able to attain for this event the presence of 27 out of 42 of its members' institutions from Puerto Rico United States, and United States. We also welcome attendees from other institutions and organizations who are interested on this topic as well. Now, the HEADS Consortium is proud to proceed with the presentation of a highly quality series of best practices. It is a pleasure to be joined by a group of such distinguished and accomplished academic leaders. The members of this morning panel are the presenters who obtained the highest scores in each conference track. Please, um, they're already on stage. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> we, we are privileged to already have them on stage. Please welcome Dr. Michael Hotmaker. 
Dean for Student Affairs at Borough of Manhattan Communi Community College, who received the highest score in the retention track. Congratulations, Dr. Hutmaker. Applause, another one. <laughs> Please welcome Mr. Rolando Mendez from Inter-American University, who received the highest score in the online learning and technology integration track. Congratulations, Mr. Mendez. <laughs> Unfortunately, Ms. Lori Austin, Director of Admissions of Lehman College, who received the highest score not only within the access track, but among all the tracks, is not able to join us today. Uh, finally, it is an honor to have Dr. Carlos Morales, Heads Vice, Pre Vice Chair and President of TCC Connect Campus from Tehran Community College at this sessions, as this session's moderator. Please give him a warm welcome, uh, Dr. Morales, who will be, introduce our panelists and begin the discussion. Good morning and thank you uh, for the introduction. Um, as, as we were briefed earlier, we are very, uh, you know, grateful and I guess also um, lucky to have uh, these two professionals this morning to share some of their uh, practices and strategies as they relate to uh, the two big tracks here, retention as well as online learning and technology integration. Uh, we'll start um, this, this session with what we will call kind of a teaser because there are two presentations later on by each of them. So um, the first one, I'm sorry, the first one in sequence is Dr. Michael Hotmaker. So uh, we'll, we'll start with that. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank HETS for recognizing our, our submission, myself and my colleague, Ms. Deborah Hart, who is back in New York. Uh, we're very humbled to have received that recognition. Uh, I know in, in higher education, we sort of have all the same goals and aspirations of making sure our students succeed and continue and graduate and achieve their goals. And I think really we, we are just using, you know, we keep on building on each other's ideas. So for us to be recognized, we're really humbled about that because uh, there are a lot of uh, great uh, presentations and uh, ideas and concepts that are being shared here today. So. Uh, first, all, I wanted to say with that, well, thank you. So, uh, so my topic uh, was within the retention track, uh, and we wanted to focus on a concept we call at Borough Manhattan Community College, enhancing a culture of care, and we put a little twist on it and redefining uh, in local parentis. Uh, so let me talk about a little bit about BMCC uh, first, so you get an idea of who we are and what we do. So we're part of the City University of New York uh, system. Uh, we're one of the seven community colleges in the system. We are the largest school of all the schools in uh, the CUNY system uh, of about 25, over 25,000 students. Uh, we're located in lower downtown Manhattan near World Trade Center uh, down in Tribeca, which is also one of the uh, richest uh, zip codes in the country. So it, it's kind of a uh, you know, just, juxtaposition because our students do not live there. Most of our faculty and staff don't live there either uh, because of the cost of living there. You have Robert De Niro and other movie stars and rich people living down there. So, uh, so all our students are coming throughout the New York City to come down uh, to take classes in our, in our school. We have over 50 uh, majors and concentrations for our students uh, that they come. Uh, we are at a hub of uh, lower Manhattan. We have, you know, 10 to 12 different subways that stop right near our campus. So students can get to our campus from anywhere in the city. Uh, we have representatives, students from over 168 countries around the world. We speak over 100 different languages in our hallways. So it's a, it's a global campus. Uh, again, but most of our students, uh, you know, we are a Hispanic serving institution, 41% Latinx uh, population, uh, when that population is the group that's been growing consistently over the last 10 years, while African Americans, Asians, whites, and others have been consistent or declining slightly. Uh, so we're growing a Latinx population. The, uh, the concept of in local parentis, uh, most of you have heard of that, but it, it translates in, in, in place of the parents. So 
Yeah, most universities throughout history uh, have taken a role of being in taking the role of, of the parent for for students back when we uh, back when universities started. So families would send their, their children to college and just assume that they would take over taking care of them. And there's usually two roles when you think about being a parent. Uh, you know, the first one is to be you know, loving and nurturing and taking care of them. But then there's the other side, which is setting structure rules and making sure they keep the straight and narrow and, and developing morally, ethically into, into great citizens. Uh, traditionally, universities have focused on the second, you know, being more setting the structure, the rules, the policies of how to you know, live their lives. And you know, their rules, it was their way, their highway type of approach. So you follow the uh, the, the, const, uh, the, the, the foundations of the school, the rules of the school, where you don't stay there. Uh, so that was the traditional uh, approach to the to the inloco parentis that universities have played. Uh, that changed a little bit in the 60s uh, in the United States with regard to the civil rights movements. Students were starting to fight for their rights. Uh, so universities backed off a little bit and they took no responsibility for the students' actions so they can do what they want. Uh, the, the focus on the, um, you know, with that part uh, was for a little bit, and then in the 70s and 80s, they started changing again when uh, the, the universities started taking a little bit more responsibility of the care of the students, because they really felt there was a balance. They couldn't take no responsibility for the actions of the students. So there, there has, over time, last 20, 30 years, more of a merging together that it's going to be a combination of the students taking responsibility for their actions and the university uh, making sure that they're following that. You know, back in the old days, again, like before uh, the students started fighting for their rights of uh, that, uh, that they had as students, uh, think of the movie Animal House, you know, the double secret probation. You know, those, that's where you know, the university is set. They can do what they want with the students. They can kick them out uh, for whatever reasons. And, you know, I'm, I'm presenting a little bit later, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you some examples of that, um, of, of what the schools were doing. But, you know, there's been a, a change. Uh, with more of a focus of meeting the needs of the students. A lot of our students are coming uh, to colleges now with a lot of needs that they don't get at home or they uh, need to persist and, and succeed in colleges. It's financial, it's homelessness, it's food insecurity, uh, it, it's childcare, it's uh, travel, transportation, a lot of issues. So the universities have been moving toward creating that. Uh, so universities and colleges have always been doing some sort of culture of care, taking care of our students. We've created different uh, focus areas that we would focus on uh, work with students with different populations. We have, for instance, veterans uh, resource centers, uh, LGBT centers, international student offices, uh, scholarships, learning, uh, academic learning communities. All these things were set up to create more of a connection to the campus for the students. And uh, they're not just there to follow the rules in the handbook, that they're there to learn and grow and develop and they have someone to help them connect to the college. A lot of studies show that when students are connected and feel that they are part of the community, that they matter, that they belong, uh, there's no imposter syndrome. A lot of students come like, I don't belong in college after their first exam. They do belong there. They just need you know, that adjustment period. And that's where a lot of universities are moving toward to creating this culture of care. Uh, so you know, at BMCC, we've been really focused on doing this um, enhancing the traditional ones, like I said, like the uh, international students, veteran students, diversity centers, and we, we're creating uh, smaller approaches to make sure the students that are not part of those identifiable groups are still connected in some way. So we use data uh, from our uh, database to find students to see how they're connected to each other from different ways. Uh, to create these uh, smaller groups where we can connect them. We assign staff and faculty to work with them to create that connection to the campus. The, uh, you know, the role that the uh, campus has in creating this culture of care, it's not just the, the, the staff members that are assigned. It's, a, it's, it's everyone's responsibility to take care of it. It's what happens in the classroom. You think about you know, working in student affairs, we see students who need to come to us or they choose to come to us through our different programs or are invited to. On the other side, faculty see every student every day, every week. So we have to have a real strong partnership with the faculty that they make sure that they're a part of this culture of care, that they're looking out for our students, that they're directing them in the right direction to get the services and needs they, they need to con continue with students. Because most of the time, students don't succeed in the classroom because of academic reasons. It's because of, at least at a community college, 
there's a lot of other life issues that they're dealing with uh, that really sometimes gets in their way of succeeding. And a lot of students don't have education as a top priority where it fluctuates. You know, this week it is a top priority, but next week work is a top priority. And the week after that, it's taking care of a family member as their top priority. So it fluctuates. Where traditional four-year school students may have education as their only priority, where they live on campus and their parents are taking care of their bills and all that. So uh, for the population that we're working with, education fluctuates as their top priority. So we want to create opportunities where they don't have to worry about those uh, external factors that are impacting them. Uh, so I think that really just sums up you know, a lot of what we're doing. And if you want more, I'll be presenting a little bit later. Uh, so I'll pass it back to our moderator. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hotmaker. Um, I have a, well, first of all, um, I, I find the topic very interesting because we continue to, to find ways um, in which we will, you know, we need to help our students uh, complete, you know, be successful in their, in their studies and, and progress to the next level, whatever it is, the four year, you know, uh, workforce, etc. cetera. So uh, certainly these topics are, of, of mutual interest. Um, I'm gonna ask a few questions just to guide the conversation and certainly I'm just following a, a, my, my own script here. But, um, and maybe you alluded to this and, and without stealing the, the, the thunder of your session later uh, this afternoon, if you can share with us um, what, what was the, uh, the, the impetus, what, what trigger identifying this uh, as an area of support for students, if you can expand a little bit. Right, like, like I mentioned, you know, universities have been doing some sort of outreach and, and trying to care for our students. Uh, we just never really gave it a name. So at Borough Manhattan Community College, we're, you know, we're really moving toward making this a campus-wide uh, focus. Uh, so much so that it's now embedded into our strategic planning and our next upcoming cycle for our strategic planning, okay. which we're working on now. So it's very important that it's not just an idea out of student affairs, it's not just an idea out of the president's office, it's pervasive across the entire campus that everyone has a role to play. Everyone from the faculty, the president, the faculty, to the administration, to the frontline staff that are working with the students on a daily basis, to the support staff. It's the way you treat people, it's the way you make the students feel welcome and uh, feel a part of, of the, the community. Uh, we're just, we're packaging it now uh, as a, as a culture, you know, mm -hmm. rather than just little pockets of people doing their own, their own thing. Uh, it, it brings us together, it aligns us so we're not being redundant, you know, in times of sure. resources that needs to be stretched, you know, it's kind of silly when one group is doing, you know, uh, a mentoring program while another group is doing their own mentoring program. You bring them together so you have one mentoring program type of approach. So we want to reduce redundancy by, you know, bringing the whole campus together to work on their uh, various concepts and it, again everyone buys in everyone's participating and has insight and input into how to work with the students and of course we always bring the students in to hear how we're doing uh, we may think we have fantastic ideas and think this is the best thing uh, to, for student success and the students are like nope you're missing that totally what we need what we want and what our focus is uh, and having people understand that uh, you know, so it, it's you know, that's how we sort of came about developing it and it's bringing in all the service uh, areas, a lot of student affairs, a lot of that in academic affairs to support the students both inside and outside the classroom uh, to meet both their academic and their personal needs. Thank you. Um, and again, without you know, using the teaser approach, um, what, what additional challenges, uh, if you can share, um, you and your team have identified um, students facing? Uh, um, again, you know, what additional challenges students face that this initiative will help uh, address, you know, and, and remove barriers or whatever it is. Yeah, the, you know, a lot of students come to us uh, and they're first generation students. They don't have anyone really to guide them on what college is. They don't know the terminology. They don't know what a bursar is. They don't know, uh, you, know you know, what financial aid or FAFSA means. So, you know, it's educating them right from the beginning, right from the admissions point of view. So that's some of the challenges, just getting them to get into a uh, mindset of what the, this new environment that they're joining is, mm -hmm. uh, learning the terminology. You know, it's just like learning a language. 
uh, you, get, you, you go to a different country, you, know, you, you, you try to pick up the language. It, college could be a different country for uh -huh. some students. Uh, you know, they're used to high school or they're coming from uh, all over the world. So learning the systems that we have in, in, within City University uh, or the United States helps them do that. Uh, the biggest challenge our students face is financial. Uh, almost, you know, I think it's about 80%, 90% of our students have some sort of uh, eligibility for financial aid. Uh, the, the household income is below, I think it's uh, like about 75% of our students are under like $30,000 a year living in New York City. That doesn't go very far. So there's always challenges. So there, like I said before, part, sometimes education is not the top priority. They have to go to work. They have to pick up a different shift. They have to pay for transportation you know, to get to school. Like I said, no one lives in our neighborhood right. because it's Tribeca mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, so they have to get there. So they have to take the public transportation and that costs money. Uh, so we find ways of partnering with the foundations, uh, uh, corporations to help support us, uh, to support our students in emergency needs. We have students that have to drop out because of a, a rent issue, a, a legal issue, uh, health issues. So we find uh, emergency funds to help them. Uh, we're moving toward uh, open uh, educational resources so they don't have to buy books. Sure. Uh, we actually have a, a, a student can come to BMCC and graduate with a degree in criminal justice without ever buying a book. Uh, so that's the direction nice. we're trying to go mm -hmm. into. So it's looking at those things to try to reduce those stressors that students come with. And, and finally, knowing that HETS is about technology and the integration and everything, if you can talk a little bit about how you are integrating technology yeah. towards supporting this initiative. Yeah, I mean, we're using all tools uh, you know, that the, the university and the college have. You know, we're using um, Starfish uh, software to help connect the faculty to the students. We're using data from our uh, database to identify students and do a lot of data analytics. So we find out how successful our programs are, how we're connecting to them, if they're effective, how do we change them. So we're doing a lot of deep dives into our data. Uh, we're finding, you know, the different forms and uh, information that the students provide us, how can we use that to find those affinity groups, those small groups that we want to bring together. Uh, you know, we find out through different forms if a student belongs in the foster care system, so we can invite them to participate and re receive resources that they may or may not know they're entitled to. Um, you know, I, we, we view technology as an instrument, as a tool. Um, and you know, as fantastic as they are, as complex as they are, you know, you, have to, you can add on to them to get even more mm -hmm. uh, powerful uses out of them. But without the players, um, without the people, without the skill sets of those people, it's like having a, you know, a beautiful piano in front of you, and I can look at it, I can't play it. You know, it's a great instrument, but it's useless. You need the people that know how to use it, to use it effectively to create mm -hmm. beautiful music, to help our students right. succeed. So it's a real, um, it, it, it's, it's having the, the the tools, the technology, uh, but you, you also need the people that know how to use it effectively to get the most out of it. Uh, you know, myself, I have an iPhone and it has all these fantastic features. I'm not very, you know, I'm sure it does, you know, 80% more than what I'm using sure. it for. Uh, you know, but I'm sure, you know, other colleagues have an iPhone, they live on it, and that's all they do. Right. Um, so once you have the people that have the skills, you train them, get them prepared to use the, all the technology you have. Again, we have a whole different, different whole different array of uh, software that we use to help uh, retain our students and work with our students to help them succeed. But you need the people uh, to really understand it, to work with the students. Sure, thank you. Um, we want to use a few minutes now to open uh, for questions uh, from the audience. Uh, there are two microphones at each side of the, of the room um, for them to have uh, questions at the moment. Okay. Good morning, Eduardo Leva, Cal State Long Beach. So I have a question. So I know that there's a trend as far as creating, you know, special programs for special populations. And I know a conversation at the university is that, uh, especially in the Division of Student Affairs, you know, we, we get the students, we work with them every day. Um, what type of mechanism do you have for that Cross collaboration between student affairs and academic affairs, because I know that sometimes you know if, we, if you do you have like a faculty mentoring program where this information is provided, 
Because sometimes, you know, um, with students that I work with, you know, we give them all the support and then they go and speak to a faculty and sometimes some faculty do understand where these students are coming from. Sometimes they may not, un may not know the information, but how do you bridge those two, you know, sometimes kind of, you know, silos? If you can share with us a little bit, that'll be great. Yeah, like I said, we, you know, we've moved to really embedding this approach into our strategic planning and, you know, it's very vital that the faculty are a part of it. Like I said before, they see all our students every day, a couple times a week, uh, and they're, they're our front line, they're our eyes and ears. So, you know, uh, through our this personal relationships, uh, developing with, the, uh, with our vice president and, you know, being part of the academic senate, really just always have that conversation of how can we improve um, you know, the, the success of our students. And that is, you know, that, that's everyone's goal at, at, the, at the college. We come at it from different angles. We'll come at it from a student affairs outside the classroom approach. Faculty are trying to get them to succeed inside the classroom. But there is that point where they merge where what's happening outside affects what's happening inside. Um, so you know, we create these, these partnerships with the faculty. We have uh, collaborations with them to understand uh, you know, what students are going through. You know, the faculty, you know, we have a lot of faculty that have similar pasts of our students so they can relate, so they understand, but we have a lot of faculty that don't, so we have to sort of um, show them and have them understand where our students are coming from. So much so that we have, we've created faculty uh, leadership uh, fellowships on our campus for our faculty, for, for younger upcoming faculty. Uh, at our winter convocation, which is happening next week, the whole concept is going to be focused on uh, culturally responsive pedagogy, where faculty and staff are understanding where our students are coming from. Uh, it's not just where you're born or what your ethnicity is, it's all these other different factors. It's your socioeconomic, it's your life experiences uh, that students are coming in. So, you know, sitting in front of, you know, having a faculty with students in front of them, they don't know what's happening. They can see what you look like, they can see what you sound like, but they don't know what else you're experiencing, what else you've had to deal with in your life. Um, you know, you know, we, especially, like for instance, with our veterans population, our Veterans Resource Center does uh, military competency workshops for our faculty. Uh, to help them understand what the lives of the, faculty, the military, uh, the, the veteran students are. They're coming in, they're a little bit older, they've had these experiences, unfortunately people never should have experienced. But they're in our classroom and there are triggers that they may have that faculty, staff aren't aware of. So having these types of trainings throughout the year, we do the same thing for our students with uh, accommodation needs. We have that, that the Office of Accessibility, uh, have workshops for our faculty to have them understand a student that has a learning disability or a physical disability, how we can help them. So it's really just continuous conversations. Uh, it is you know, minimizing the silos as much as we can and understanding that there is this connection uh, above all to get students to succeed. Thank you. Sure. Just a quick question. So I love the idea of the loco parentis, but you know, that's a legal term. And I'm just curious, uh, does that uh, build any implications for the university in claiming that you're doing that? So I'll leave you there. Right. Well, yeah, we, we're not really using it in that term. We're using more of it as a concept, of, as an approach. You know, to uh, you know, we don't go out and advertise. Say we're you know we're doing we're changing in local parentis. Uh, you know, this you know we're, we're working with our students. We're using it as the concept that you know parents have play dual roles. You're you know you're the caregivers. You you provide safety, shelter, love to the to your child, but you also provide structure. And like I said, the focus has uh, traditionally been more on the structure part at the university. Uh, you know, we're not changing that, but we're adding you know, the more of the caring part, the nurturing part, to uh, make sure that the students are succeeding. So that's, you know, that was the, more of a, a twist on how something that exists, we're taking it a step further and adding this other piece to it to make sure that, you know, we're caring for the students. We're not just making sure that there's uh, a person in the seat taking a test and they're just a number to us. We want to make sure that everyone understands that they are a person, they have uh, abilities, and we want to make sure they maximize those. Sure. Thank you for the questions. If there are any other questions, you know, we, we, we will still hear uh, for a few more minutes. So um, let's move on to the next part of the of the panel. Um, this morning is with us Dr. Rolando Mendez from uh, Inter-American University of Puerto Rico. And he will talk about online learning and technology integration. Of course, he's also um, delivering an, a more extended session uh, this afternoon. So, uh, Rolando, take it away. 
Okay, uh, I'm also doing the same approach, uh, not giving too much away so you can come later in the session and learn more about our project, which kind of picks up on the uh, concept you mentioned about embedding. And in this project we did at the Ponce campus was embedding the librarians in online courses. Uh, we were finding uh, a little bit about our institution where uh, university system comprised of nine campuses and two professional schools where I was working at the moment was the Ponce campus and we had like the about uh, 1500 uh, students online students and at least uh, uh, the same amount of students taking at least one online course uh, and we saw uh, we were when we when the faculty was meeting we were hearing over and over again that the students according to faculty members, were uh, having some difficulties uh, with information literacy, although there is a course they usually take on the first year, which is information, uh, Introduction to Informational Literacy and, and Computer Literacy, but it's like a, a big, uh, broad course where you have to do a, uh, cover a lot of topics and, and, and try to get uh, students to develop a lot of competencies. And <clears throat> we were trying to figure out how we could uh, help students become better uh, learners, better researchers, better, better information consumers. So we had a faculty development activity where we had this uh, librarian coming from, I think it was the University of Wisconsin, and she talked about the embedded librarianship model, which consists of partnering uh, librarians with faculty members uh, inside the classroom, uh, in, uh, maybe in a specific periods of times or throughout the entire semester or terms. Uh, and they help out, they act out, or their, their role is being a, kind of a assistance in, in the process of developing those skills and trying students to, helping students, I'm sorry, uh, understand how to research information, how to locate it, how to filter it, how to consume it, and then later on how to communicate it to their peers, to the faculty members, and in, in the context of doing their assignments or doing their activities related to the course. So uh, we did this project in three phases. Uh, two of them were very formal, where we had like call for uh, requests for faculty members that wanted to participate. We had meetings, we had uh, training, and then we had some professors that went kind of rogue, which was a good thing because they, they saw that the model was working for them, so they started doing their own iterations of the embedded librarianship model. And what we had in those first two, we started at the undergraduate level because we said this is not something that only pertains to master, uh, students at, uh, at a graduate or doctoral level. It, it should start from the beginning, from the base. So we started identifying courses that had research-based activities and then we had uh, the librarians help out faculty members develop those activities and, and really make sure that those activities help students uh, develop the uh, information literacy. Because sometimes one of the problems we saw is faculty members uh, usually ask students to locate information and then to uh, write essays or write uh, different assignments and then the faculty members them, themselves, they don't know where to locate that information the student needs or how to filter it. And, and we also needed to work on their uh, information and literacy competencies as well. Uh, and then uh, we had the librarians in, uh, being the online courses uh, for, I think it was three weeks. Then uh, we had a period where they offered online uh, synchronous workshops on APA, on searching for information, on doing reference lists, et cetera. And then they went back into the course and they uh, assisted students throughout a forum, throughout messages. And we try to see how uh, the students, uh, how that activity or how that model helps students uh, become better learners or become uh, more literate in, in, in that sense. And it was very interesting to, the, to see that they thought that it was useful having a librarian inside the, uh, inside the course, especially when we are used to having uh, students go to the library and go there and ask for any information. It was taking a more proactive approach and having them inside the classroom and doing activities that are really relevant to the course and to what they're doing at the moment and seeing the relevance of all those resources that the university has that they are integrated into what they're doing in that course. 
uh, the one the one of the later uh, in the second phase we we included uh, doctoral level courses uh, it was a very interesting and and doctoral students obviously were more eager to participate and did ask more questions and sought the librarians out more often and obviously because of the nature of their of the courses they were taking and then one of the iterations included uh, doing a Slack community, a community in Slack, where we had a statistics professor, one of the librarians, my colleague Linda Mayo, who couldn't be here today. Uh, and outside the classroom, they could interact with the student, because usually when the students have those doubts, when they are looking for the information, it's not necessarily when the university or the campus is operating, you know, during business hours. So that was a space where uh, they could get help outside of, of the normal operating hours of the university. And basically, uh, it was, I mean, we're still trying to refine the project because when we first went into the project, one of the, the biggest lessons learned was that we underestimated the project. <laughs> I mean, we only had about four librarians, and they're a really good team of librarians. I mean, whatever we come up with, they say yes to it, and they just jump in, and we didn't have enough librarians for about 300 sections, so we had to find a way to scale that model, and, and we're trying to see how we can integrate it into all the courses without having the need of having the librarian inside the courses during the term, and doing something that is you know, across the board and not just in one course. Uh, a specific course, I mean. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mendez, for, for um, this subject uh, and the importance, reminding us the importance of the librarians in uh, supporting uh, not only online students, but all students. Uh, that, that is a topic of, of much interest for me uh, as an online um, leader as well because the information literacy is key and, and if we are telling, telling students that they um, you know, must operate in, in the online learning world, they need to learn also how to discriminate, if that is the proper term that I can use for um, <clears throat> you know, information which is good and, and, and not so good. So with that said, um, the, the, one of the questions that, that comes here um, has to do with um, and I think you alluded to this, and again, without uh, stealing the, the whole uh, concept from your, your session later on, can you share with us a, a little bit more in terms of uh, maybe a specific strategy uh, that you can, that you have implemented for, for a faculty member or a subject, if you will, uh, for them to uh, adopt and integrate the information literacy and the librarians model that you are uh, alluding to. So can you expand a little bit maybe in a subject or maybe you know, a particular uh, a prof professor, if, if, if you will? Yes, when we started the project, we, we, we took that approach. We just looked at our academic offering and we said, oh, these courses are more, more or less research-based or includes, uh, include research-based uh, activities. But then we saw when we sat down with other professors or faculty members, we realized that in every online course, there, there's some research involved, right? And, and online learners and online instructors are uh, constantly working with information, so they sure. should be literate. So we're, we found that it's not a disciplinary thing, a, a thing related to the discipline of the instructor or a course, it's related to some core competencies a student or a professional should have. And we're trying to see how we can integrate that in all the courses, mm -hmm. but in a way that it just comes out naturally, like writing skills, because that's another area where we have faculty members, oh, they don't know how to write, they should have learned that in that Spanish course, that English course, that writing course, but the writing skills are supposed to be learned all the way <laughs> in all the courses, mm -hmm. in one way or another, and, and you, get that, uh, you get that approach as well. So we're trying to, to embed it into the curriculum instead of like a course particularly and into the mindset of the faculty members because sometimes we ask them to for these activities but we don't we need to take the time to understand how they search for information which is very different from when we were when we used to search for information for our thesis or for our dissertations I mean I remember going to the library and looking <laughs> very manually for for resources now they just go to their phones and then click and, and we have to teach them now or focus 
what information is, is, is mm -hmm. relevant, what information is uh, reliable, and there's another challenge with that, with the new framework by, by the American uh, by ACL, uh, which now it says that information and authority is contextual, so that comes into play now and mm -hmm. try to see how we can teach students to know when, for example, a tweet by the president is a relevant and, and information that can be used because that is one of the me, uh, mediums he uses to communicate, right? Where in a traditional sense, you would, a instructor would say, no, you cannot use a twi right. tweet or you cannot cite Wikipedia or you cannot cite a blog, you know? And, and we have to start searching uh, or understanding these new forms or, of communication that are valid, that are relevant, that uh, have authority, so we can incorporate them into the courses. And, and as you uh, mentioned, uh, the new things, if you will, and how they are still valid for education, uh, uh, Google Scholar is a, is a touchy topic, and I don't know how many librarians are in the audience, you know, uh, um, is that the right tool for us to search uh, for references? Um, Maybe it is for immediacy, okay, uh, even though we have access to our library databases, but you know, it, it, it also has a purpose um, in helping us, I don't know, refine or get uh, more of those uh, resources. Uh, and another comment, and actually this is the other question, uh, we have talked about uh, training faculty, you know, the the uh, keynote speaker, other, other colleagues through the, the different uh, concurrent sessions talk and recognize the importance of training and support for faculty. Do you, do you either include um, um, information literacy as part of your uh, online training or do you foresee adding that or that you know, uh, 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 training programs would, would or need to include a library slash information literacy element for faculty? When we started the project, we had some faculty training, so the, the specific instructor would know which databases the university had, which resources the university had where they could uh, direct their students to. But then we, uh, our faculty uh, development program, then we, we kind of tweaked it and, and we based it in five competencies, including social, research, and then uh, within the research component, we started including uh, some of the uh, some workshops in that in that area. Usually, they center more about APA use, locating mm -hmm. resources. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to go beyond that and start working on specific, like you know, identifying different resources that outside right. of what we traditionally use. And part of what I'm going to uh, present later is we use Wikipedia. Uh, and yes, we use Wikipedia, but it, we use it as a starting point because that's what the students are familiarized with. So if you wanna uh, get familiarized with a topic in five minutes, you can go search, search uh, Wikipedia, then you can read, and then you can go to Google Scholar, and then, which is more user-friendly to them, and then right. you can switch to our databases mm -hmm. and to other resources. So we do it like step by step. We, just, we don't send them right into the databases, which could frustrate them because they, I mean, this is something new for them. This is not something they learned in high school or they, they learned in another course. So we, we go step by step. Go to Wikipedia, then go to Google Scholar. When you find something that you think you can use, then try to uh, reach out to the librarian if you cannot navigate the databases. But uh, we need to, but going back to the question, we need to include additional uh, training activities or development activities that are more, more specific other than, the, than like searching for information or what databases we have available or how do we cite in APA. And, and uh, hearing you mention this, uh, another question comes to mind in terms of, uh, and maybe you have heard this, the 21st century skills, you know, there is a, an effort, um, um, or not a movement, but you know, a recognition that students now, and, and I guess everybody in the learning uh, phase of things, need to be cognizant of those. Um, how how um, you can, um, align the two elements, you know, uh, the information literacy aspect as well as the century, I mean, the 21st century skills. And again, knowing that this could be for faculty as well as for students in, in online or in face-to-face -face environments. Can you expand a little bit? Uh, when you think of uh, literacy, uh, informational literacy is knowing 
when you have a problem, where to find the information to solve that problem, how to locate viable resources, and then how to communicate the mm -hmm. solution you found. So that's very related to problem solving, which is one of those skills, to communication. So it's kind of embedded or in, in one of the, uh, in these skills for the 21st century. And uh, decisions are based on research, on locating information when we're using data. For example, he mentioned Starfish, we have Starfish which information is really telling me something sure. about my students and which one is not. So they have to have that, you know, that, uh, we, I, I'm trying to find like the word, an English word, but we call it malicia, you know, to, to, to find that. Yeah, uh, to be leery, yeah. Yes, to know which, what, what I need, or what is relevant to what I'm searching for or uh, for the decision I'm making. And, and it's kind of, it's very important in many of those 21st century skills. All right, thank you. Um, I have another question here, um, and maybe you alluded to, to this in your, in your talk, but um, quality and rigor um, in, in teaching and in academic programs. So let's, let's put that on one side of the equation and then again information literacy on the other side of the question and, and do it for face-to-face -face and online. So again, how would you um, share or help uh, faculty members uh, either increase the quality or rigor or, or keep it at the level they have it through, through these techniques? Like a standard oper operating procedure, we use uh, integrity tools such as SafeAssign, Remote Proctor Now, but we're trying to make uh, faculty aware of, of all the ways integrity can be compromised in an online course. You know, we, we the students are very creative when it comes to cheating for some reason. Sometimes we say if they use that same creativity to you know, do the coursework, the story would be different and we have higher uh, graduation rates and in lower times. But for example, we have the, the, the student that sacrifices him or herself taking the proctor test so he, can, he or she can get the questions and then passes on the answers to all the to other students. Uh, and, and that rotates in, during the semester. So we have to start thinking about course learning activities, not as a requirement or to just make, oh, check, they learned about this, oh, check, you know, but more about how, how students can develop a framework or, or, or a set of mind related to the discipline, mm -hmm. which is based on integrity, which is based on professional competence, which is based on uh, other many skills that are very important. and, and, and tests and assignments that they, they don't vary each semester. I mean, we sure. have instructors offering the same test every semester, every semester, every semester. They don't even change one question. They don't even change the order, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Uh, or giving the same assignment without changing the case. Or So we're trying to, they need to start working on different ways to assess learning and so that it, in. <coughs> First, in first place, uh, it helps students develop the competencies that it, uh, he or she needs uh, for that particular course and uh, ensure integrity in, and quality in online courses because that's another responsibility we have uh, to our students and to uh, all the accrediting uh, organizations and licensing organizations out there. All right, thank you. Let's hear it from the audience. Uh, any questions uh, that may come up in terms of um, literacy competencies and uh, information literacy. Yeah. Yes. Good morning. Uh, why can you uh, give us more information regarding the assessment part? Uh, not going too deep because I know the presentation is later. The how do you manage the assessment part and the data for the project? Yeah. For many of the courses, it was like a like an essay or a research project. Uh, for example, one of the courses in the initial phase was uh, uh, human behavior in organizations, which is a, a very interesting course because it has many topics that, is, that are very relevant to students, like you know, leadership, negotiation, communication, diversity, among others. So in that course specifically, they would have to um, look for information to support their views and arguments in discussion forums because that specific course was a discussion-based classroom. Whereas in a, an advanced English course, which is called writing and research, they have to produce a writing paper by the end of the term. So they start writing the first draft, 
they, uh, they find their top, they select their topic, they research a topic, then they do their first draft, second draft, and I mean, they, these uh, deliverables help uh, the instructors see how students were really incorporating what they were learning with the librarian into that specific activity. And I think one of the other courses, it was a science course. One had, in one of the courses, they had to create a blog, and in another, I think it was a final paper as well. So it, it depended on the course uh, participating. And for doctoral courses, obviously, it was the research proposal. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? As, as those come up, uh, uh, this is also an, an element um, that helps not only the faculty, but the organizations, the institutions, be more, um, um, I guess, aligned with accreditation. Uh, can you talk a little bit more in terms of how would this support that type of, of, of um, I'm not sure if it is a standard, but how, how it will support that type of practice to, th to strengthen uh, courses and academic programs? I think in, it would be reflected in the type of student that graduates from the program uh, and it's closely related to what uh, accreditation agencies are, are looking for, you know, that uh, the students are being, I mean, we offer students that they're going to learn this and that and they're going to develop these competencies and they actually do. And when we take an approach where information, which is so relevant today, uh, in an information and knowledge-based society is important and, and we just not stay on the surface and, and um, kind of move away from the mentality that textbooks and the instructor are the only ways the student can learn or get the information from. Uh, that actually creates a new a new kind of, I, I think, a, approach to education where you can be competent in what you're supposed to do and be a better information consumer in terms of whatever you find out there and you can discriminate what is really, for example, right now what we ha what's happening on the island, a lot of people start sharing and sharing WhatsApp messages and uh, images in Facebook and they're not even related. They don't even take the time to discriminate on students, everyone, <laughs> parents included, you know. And I think in, in, the, in the sense that students become better consumers of information where they can, they can become better think, thinkers and they can think critically. They can argue, why are you telling me this is the correct way to, to do this in terms of an assessment in, 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 in health or an approach or strategy in business when there are other views or when I, I start expanding uh, into other disciplines and integrating from those other disciplines to my discipline uh, and, and start trying to see how that informs what I do and what I think and, and what I, how I view the world. And sometimes, you, I mean, besides getting the results by the end of the semester and the quality of the program and the reputation, is maybe that is intrinsically linked to accreditation standards, but that other part, I think it also helps because it helps with the reputation, it helps with, with uh, the reputation of faculty, the program, the graduates, and the alumni, et cetera. All right, thank you. Um, let, let's go back to uh, Dr. Hotmaker um, and one, one question that I, <clears throat> that I had here also uh, that I would think we, we would ask has to do with um, you know, care you know, and, and how you arrive to this particular phase and, and project, if you will. Can you talk um, a little bit in terms of um, the different barriers, if you will, that maybe were identified before? Um, that led to, to this iteration of activities that you are you know, proposing or maybe that you are expanding now? Yeah, the, you know, the, the, the approach we did, again, was looking at data, looking at results of our students and the success, uh, finding out where they were stumbling. You know, why were they not continuing with their education? Why were they dropping out? Um, and in, you know, talking to them, looking at their information in the system, looking at their grades, uh, and look, uh, finding out what their economic, you know, financial aid, and then you're using that as a starting, almost like Wikipedia, that's the starting point. And then you dive deeper mm -hmm. uh, in, into, their, into their records, you talk to the students, you talk about their, um, you know, who they're, who they're connected with. And 
the important thing is, is making sure that the students are getting connected to campus because if all we know about them is what their grades are and what their financial aid forms say and no one has ever had any connection with them, we don't know anything about them. We don't know what their struggles are. So it's creating this caring environment uh, to have these conversations, a safe area where a student can go and talk to uh, a coordinator, a counselor, a faculty member where they can say, I'm hungry. I have no place to sleep tonight. I'm sleeping on the subway. You know, all these things you don't know about until they start bringing it up. Uh, I, you know, we say we do a lot of great things at BMCC. We're fantastic. And, but there's one thing we don't do very well is read minds. We don't know what they're thinking unless they start telling us. So you have to create those opportunities for them to have those conversations to feel comfortable talking about it uh, and finding out what those barriers are. Um, and then it's working with the faculty and staff to feel comfortable to have these conversations with them that you know they may not have been trained for. You know, I'm a math professor. I you know I know you know cosine and sine and all that other fun stuff, but I don't know how to have a conversation with a student who's falling asleep in my class. So it's doing these this outreach with the faculty and the staff to have this culture uh, and understanding where students are coming from and understanding their barriers. Again, it's everything from food insecurity, homelessness, uh, financial issues, uh, undocumented students. Uh, it, uh, those students are hard to work with because they don't want to share because mm -hmm. they haven't grown up in a place of trust in their whole lives. Sure. And, uh, their families haven't either. So it's, it's breaking down those, those walls and those barriers where they can feel that family, you know, BMCC, we always call ourselves a family and we try to have that uh, feeling for our students and make those connections. That's why we've, you know, worked on these, creating these smaller cohorts of students where they can come and get to know each other, uh, work with peer mentors, work with coordinators, and really allow them to open up and share what these challenges are. You know, like I said, we have 25, over 25,000 students. We have 25,000 different stories. Uh, not all are the same. They're all a little bit different here and there. Uh, you can make a general approach to some of them, but every student is unique. You have to listen to them. You have to hear their story and how can we address what you need to help you succeed. And thank you. And our institutions in, in one way or another, you know, are, are pretty similar. You know, we, ha we, we have to um, uh, find those ways in, uh, in which we will help students. In, in the case of, of my institution, one, one saying is that we uh, accept the top 100% of the students. Being, being a 100% uh, uh, percent for us is, again, is the open access. Uh, we are not a selective institution. So um, again, you know, similar to what you said, we have that number of, of, of issues or problems um, and, and finding ways for us to identify that. Uh, can you talk um, more about um, or maybe if, if you have a device a strategies or a process on a, how many barriers can you remove? I mean, and, and, and certainly, you know, <laughs> I don't expect a literal answer, but you know, how, or how many barriers are you able to identify that you can affect a, a, in a positive way to, to assist students? Again, it's you know, looking at data, using the tools and resources uh, that we have, uh, the software that helps you know, help us derive at the, what some of those challenges are. Uh, re again, making those connections with the external uh, agencies, the community members, foundations to help support us in our, in our strive to remove these barriers. You know, we're, we, all, we, we need financial assistance to, to pass it along to our students. Uh, we, we give them metro cards, we give them food vouchers, uh, we get them free health care, uh, connections to the free health care, um, free tax preparation, um, counseling. So we have all these things in place uh, and identifying them is difficult, but you know, we have a, I, I guess, you know, the stand, you know, the, the, uh, all, all the students will be facing with some of these, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Student A may have these two, student B may have these three, student C right. may have one issue. Uh, but if you could help them focus on that and, and help remove whatever that concern is for the week. And again, like I said before, with community college students, concerns are weekly. You know, their lives happen very fast and they're somewhat unpredictable. 
Uh, that's why they're in school. They're trying to better uh, themselves. And we've been fortunate at BMCC to be recognized as a, as a place where students have very successful social mobility once they graduate. Mm -hmm. uh, so, we, you know, we have, you know, th there's, a, there's a goal for the students. And uh, because of uh, what we've been doing, we, we think that all the combinations, all the different things that we're doing, there's no one thing that will help remove all the barriers. Because once we remove barrier A, barrier B is going to pop up in two weeks. <laughs> Uh, un unexpected. Uh, I know some schools, you know, may not be in a, a city like BMCC where students have to drive. So, uh, you know, I've heard someone say, you know, our students are a flat tire away from dropping out of school. Oh, yeah. So, you know, the, the car breaks down or childcare falls through. Uh, those things are real, and you know, you know, it, it, you just have to adjust it to your campus and, and your student population. Uh, but you can't remove all the barriers all the time. You just got to be able to, you know, help them one at a time and help them build skill sets to do it on their own. And we work with their families. You know, it's, we try to take a multi-generational approach to helping them solve problems. So we want to bring the student, the families, and their, their support system in as well. Uh, so a lot of our services will extend to them. Uh, because if a student is hungry at home, that means their family is hungry at home. Mm -hmm. So we'll extend some of the food services, uh, insecurity issues, support services to them, free tax preparation, tax preparation for their families. Uh, health care and stuff like that. So we want to make sure it's not just working on the student. The student still has a family to take care of as well. So. Sure. And um, w one of the things that I uh, want to mention is that in, in these two topics uh, that we um, heard this morning, um, I think that there is a common element, which is the scaffolding. You know, uh, on, the, on the side of the student uh, services, Certainly, you mentioned, you know, uh, after my question, you know, how many barriers can you identify and how many can you address? Uh, it, it is a scaffolding process. So the ones that you fix now and then, you know, the ones that come later. So hopefully, you know, students and the institution, of course, is better at uh, addressing and, and helping uh, resolve and those those things. Yeah, one thing, you know, working with our students, our students are very, uh, one of the challenges we find with students are very prideful. They don't want to tell you their mm -hmm. issues, their concerns. So again, you have to build that area of trust where they can tell you something. And that the, you know, it'll start. Well, I'm not doing well in my math class. Okay, why not? Well, you know, I can't study. Why can't you study? Well, I have to work. Why do you have to work? Well, I can't pay the rent. So it's like peeling back. Right. So you have to build this place where the students can have these safe conversations and feel comfortable. Because they're prideful, they, they want to do it on their own. They're New Yorkers. You know, they're tough and they can right. handle it. They can make it anywhere. Uh, <laughs> they make it in New York. So. They, you know, you know, they have this you know, uh, approach that they can do it on their own, but you know, we have to let them know it's okay to ask for help. You know, when I'm sick, I go to a doctor. You know, I have a sore tooth, I go to a dentist. Yep. You know, so you, you have to go to experts and professionals to help you uh, get through whatever issue you're dealing with. So. Sure, and and again, the 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 element on the faculty side uh, with with uh, Dr. Mendes part is uh, also how we can help faculty be more successful. Again, you know, the scaffolding, knowing the different techniques, knowing that that everything doesn't need to be done at once, but certainly towards being better uh, as soon as possible because students uh, require that uh, pretty soon. Um, any other questions from the audience? Okay, well, help me uh, thank our two panelists this morning. And again, congratulations for being the track winners. Uh, they have, uh, you know, individual sessions, uh, one at 10.30 a.m. for uh, Dr. Hotmaker. And uh, later today at 2, uh, Dr. Mendez uh, will deliver his session. So again, thank you for the attention this morning, and I think our MC will uh, take it over. Thanks to all panel members for your extraordinary presentations, your, com your commitment to the Hispanic community, and the improvement of education, education are truly inspirational. With this presentation and discussion, we officially conclude the plenary sessions for the HEADS 2020 Best Practices Showcase. We invite you to participate in the rest of the concurrent sessions we have today. But before, thanks to our sponsors, we will have a second raffle. All of you who received a raffle ticket at the registration table, now it's time to look for it. 
We ask Jubel Keys Montalvo to help us uh, with the raffle. Good luck to all. All right, guys, the ones who wasn't here yesterday, uh, we have a, a three different prices uh, by our sponsors. First, uh, uh, Cape Air, who is one of the um, uh, airlines uh, here that offer uh, services to uh, the islands in, in the Caribbean, and including Culebra and Vieques, and they have been a sponsor of Heads uh, also for the Student Leadership Showcase, since they have a really interest in promoting the pilot uh, pilot program that they have in, in collaboration with the Inter-American University to increase ¿verdad? The, the interest uh, of students getting in, involved in this type of career since this, uh, uh, they, they, there is a need uh, for the Vela to recruit new pilots uh, to substitute the ones who have to retire. So they have been very kind to offer us, let me see where, you, where the, winner, the winner gonna go. Hold on. To San Thomas, it's a round trip uh, to San Thomas. So please make sure you have uh, the ticket with you. Ah, espérate. Everybody have a ticket, important. See? Only one ticket. <laughs> ah, Mary, Mary Jo, you again? <laughs> ah, okay. No, no, but that's a new one. We have a new one. What do you mean a new one? Que yesterday we threw out the tickets that no, didn't like won. Yes. <laughs> so everybody have the same opportunity today. Uh, remember, you have to be here to win. So, okay. Check it out. Uh, Link's going to check it out for me. So we know. Ah, espérate, another ticket. And then let's see who win the San Thomas round three ticket. There you go. I'm going to read only the four last uh, numbers. Starting with 6869. Ah, don't you want to win again, Turner? Oh, we have a winner. Who is it? Ah, Mauricio from Colombia to San Thomas. He's the only attendee from Colombia, so we're happy that he will be, have to come back. And then, uh, because you have to take the, the flight from here, Mauricio. From here, you have to come back here and then go yeah. to San Thomas. Okay, but well, let me, okay, let me, yeah, 6A, yeah, definitely. Okay, let's take a picture for our sponsors. <laughs> there is always the first time. Pero I need the picture with my, how about you send it to me? Okay. All right, okay, but there you go. You. you just need to call this this person, mm -hmm. and she will let you know how okay. to okay. 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 But congratulations. <laughs> he said that he never win won anything, so for, there's always a first time. Okay, and then also, Office Max uh, give us a very nice uh, prize. Let me show you. With a lot of uh, different office materials. So let's see who is the winner of this. All right, we have 6770. Nope. 6770. Nope. Hey, lose it. Huh? <laughs> Let's see. Who knows? Okay, 6884. Yeah, we have someone here, a winner. And I'm glad she's from Puerto Rico because this in a baggage is kind of <laughs> difficult. So come over. Six, and we have a last uh, uh, prize. Last one more prize. So stay here. Don't go. Do it. 
Ah, qué bien, pues mira. She is from Inter-American University, Guayama Campus. Excellent, congratulations. <laughs> All right, and the last prize is uh, from, from United Airlines, and it's a United Club membership. Uh, it's a $650 a membership uh, value that uh, with this uh, membership you, are, you can enjoy access to more than 45 United Club locations, including club, Copa Club locations and participating Star Alliance affiliate airport clubs worldwide. So I hope that the, the one who wins this uh, like to travel because you, you can enjoy this uh, a lot. So let's see. Dale, Lin, go, Lin. <laughs> okay. You take two of them. Okay, it's six, eight, Seven zero. No one? Six eight seven zero. Mira, we're chairman. Are you kidding me? Oh, nice. Come over. Come over. Mira, que bien. Viste, he travels a lot. So perfect. That was perfect. <laughs> And he deserved it because he has been very supportive to this event. So congratulations. Okay, picture. <laughs> Qué bien, de verdad, mira. Oh, yeah, it's true. Qué cool. Qué bien, congratulations. So now wow, you can take it. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Heads. Uh, of course, well, you actually united. <laughs> so thank you so much. Uh, to everyone, and then our NC will give you some uh, uh, final instructions. And I want just, although she's going to mention, I want to make sure that everybody knows that the lunch will be from 12.30 to 1.30. So the two sessions that you see in the program is not going to start. It's going to start at 1.30 to 2.30. And then the, the one who says 3 going to start at 2.30, so everybody can finish at 3.30 where our closing recession will be, okay? So 12.30, then 1.30, and then 2.30, okay? Thank you so much, and let's uh, uh, finish with our NC, and I want to thank uh, Le uh, Squire Lynn uh, Collado for her uh, Bella time, and also for her great job doing uh, being our host and our NC. Thank you so much, Lynn. Go ahead. Thank you, Yubelkis. Yeah. Uh, congrat uh, congratulations to all the winners. Uh, we invite you to attend the breakout session started at uh, 10.30. On the conference program, you will find the rooms in which each presentation will be taking place. A few changes were made on the afternoon program, as Yubelkis pointed out. Now lunch will be from 12.30 to 1.30, and the sessions will be at 1.30 p.m. and 2.30 p.m., followed by the closing reception at 3.30 p.m. Before we conclude this session, we would like to give you some important news and instructions. If you need simultaneous translation, uh, you could keep the headphones until the end of the day, but please make sure to return them before you leave. All rooms uh, except Amphitheater 4 have simultaneous translation since all presentations will be in English. All presenters need to be at the room at least 15 minutes prior to their presentation. Our goal is to follow the schedule proposed in the program. If you are interested in receiving continuing education credit for this event, make sure you fill out the appropriate form at the registration area and sign the attendance list. Make sure you have your lanyard visible any time to uh, all time to facilitate the access to all presentations and coffee breaks. The lanyard is required to access lunch and co the concurrent sessions. At the registration area, you will find any additional information or ans and answers to any questions or doubt about this uh, event. 
Also, we would like to invite you this, this afternoon to join us in a very special reception to celebrate the success of this event and network with colleagues from different heads member institutions from Puerto Rico, USA, and Latin America. This reception will be taking place at the central atrium outside the theater. We will have refreshments and a music performance that we hope you will enjoy. This is sponsored by uh, PR Top Domain. We finally thank you all for accepting HEAD's invitation to participate in its 2020 Best Practices Showcase. We hope you can benefit tremendously from the resources and the networking opportunities available. We hope to see you in 2022 for the next HEAD's Best Practices Showcase. Thank you. Muchas gracias. <laughs>